check this out. True story, and parents, I gotta warn you, a little bit graphic, so use your discretion with your kids' ears this morning, but it's true. He was born May 21st, 1960, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and at first things seemed kind of normal with this young guy, that is, until he started impaling the heads of animals he killed on stakes in his yard. But that was just the beginning. As an adolescent, he soon started having fantasies of killing and mutilating men, and soon fantasy gave way to reality, and his first murder was in Ohio in 1978. Then a second murder followed in 1987, and soon, get this, he killed another 15 young men, most of them in Milwaukee, over the next five years. His gruesome crimes not only involved the murder of men, but homosexual acts with them involving cannibalism and necrophilia. And get this, to dispose of his crime, he had a 57-gallon drum where he put the bodies in vats of acid that reduced them to a black sludge, and then he poured them down the drain or flushed them down the toilet. But that's still wrong. Sometimes he would boil their heads and, and spray them with paint to make them look fake, and he would store them in his closet. And sometimes he would cut off their body parts and put them in jars of formaldehyde. But in 1991, he was finally arrested, and in February 1992, he was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms. However, on November 28, 1994, he was murdered by another one of the inmates in prison. And it was this man's gruesome actions that placed him among the most notorious serial murders of all times. His name, of course, was Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, folks, I don't know about you, but here's the point that I want to bring up with this. Man, hello, if ever there was a guy that needed to get saved and have his sins forgiven, hello, it was Jeffrey Dahmer, right? Gee whiz, but you might be out there thinking what many people think, and even Christians believe it or not. And you might be thinking something like this. Well, come on, Pastor Billy, give it up. There's no stinking way that somebody like a Jeffrey Dahmer is going to get saved. There's no way he's going to turn to Jesus Christ after what he did. It's a hopeless case. Therefore, why even try witnessing to a guy like that? There's no way he's going to respond to the gospel, right? Wrong. People of God, how dare we limit the height and the depths of God's love and forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ? People, I'm going to share with you the actual transcripts of an interview on the Larry King live show where after Jeffrey Dahmer's death, he was interviewed by Larry King. And you tell me, folks, if all hope was lost for Jeffrey Dahmer and don't question the power of the gospel. Larry King said this to Jeffrey Dahmer's father. He said this, well, how old was he? And we're speaking of Jeffrey's uh, death in prison. And his father said this, he was 33. And for the second time, I sat at my desk, totally numb, paralyzed to get the news. And King said, well, how was Jeff dealing with prison? And Mr. Dahmer said, well, at first it was extremely hard. Get this. But then he, Jeff, he, he sent away for 13 books. It's down in Alcohol, California. Institute for what? Creation. Interesting. Creation research. He said, I told him about the place. And he bought 13 books. Get this. His father's direct words that turned him from a what? Evolutionist into a creationist. And from there into a what? A Christian. And then he started witnessing in prison. And he started handing out pamphlets, his dad said, and talking to other prisons and so forth and trying to. And Larry King interrupts him and said, so he was born again? And his father said, he was. He was. I, I'm sure in talking with him. And it wasn't just a jailhouse conversion. I really believe that. And Larry King says, well, it's because he wasn't going to get out. And his father says, no. And get this. Larry King says, well, he cuts to a commercial. We'll be back with our remaining moments and find out some things we might learn after this. And he cuts to the commercial. Now, when he comes back, notice how he drops the whole born again issue. Listen to this. He says, we're back with our remaining moments. Do we know why he killed? Notice he skipped the whole Christian thing. But his father says this. Well, we don't know why he killed. I really believe that there was a chance of finding that out had he not been murdered and had he been studied extensively. And Larry King says this. Well, could it have been the inability to interact with people? Repeat after me. Duh. Okay. <laughs> what a question. And his father says this. Well, yeah, duh, that's part. Even the psychiatrist that examined him for the purpose of the trial didn't really know why he did. Now, pay attention. Here's my point. Here's the justification Jeffrey Dahmer had by his own lips of why he did those gruesome crimes. His father says this. But he did tell me why he felt that he could do what he did, why he felt free to do what he did. He told me that, and this was after reading the books on creation science, that he, Jeffrey, felt he was up. Up from the slime, as he put it, you know, molecules to amoebas to Larry type of thing. Evolution, people. That there, and it teaches what? That there was nothing, no direction by God, no one to be accountable to, nothing to answer to at all. And Larry King says, that's what he believed? Hello, people, what do you think evolution teaches? That's right. And Mr. Dahmer says, that's what he felt. Here's my point. That's why he felt he could do whatever he wanted to do. That's quite different from knowing the cause, i.e., Psalm 19. There is a God. 
Folks, I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty obvious. It sure sounds to me that Jeffrey Dahmer, yes, Jeffrey Dahmer, actually gave his life to Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And here's my point, folks. Who in the world who would have thought a real-life actual cannibal would one day become a born-again Christian? Isn't that amazing? But folks, here's the bigger point I want you to focus on. Okay? Pay attention. What was it, what, if you will, witnessing technique was it that turned Jeffrey Dahmer around to turn his life over to Jesus Christ and get saved? It was what? The creation versus evolution debate, right? I mean, who in the world, one, would have thought of that one? And two, apparently the proof is in the pudding. This creation evolution stuff, it must be a powerful way to share the gospel. Amen? And Bill, that's what precisely why we're going to continue our study. That's right, the witness of creation. And if you guys recall from last time, what we've been doing is taking a look at five different evidences of creation. Why? So that God left behind for us that we should know that He is real. Here's the mind blower. That we really can have a personal, intimate relationship with who? The creator of the universe. It's absolutely amazing. And last time we saw the first evidence was simply the evidence of an intelligent creation. We weren't here by chance. Are you kidding me? There's design in everything from a flea to a bee to a tree to you and me. Hello? Okay? And it came from God. That's what Romans chapter 1 was saying. And we saw 11 evidences there dealing with scientific data showing us God exists. And that was the evidence of the universe, the solar system, the whole human body, the animal kingdom, plant and bacteria kingdoms, symbiotic relationships, genetic similarities. And that's right, folks. Science, true science, shows evidence of intelligent design. But that's right, folks. Believe it or not. Did you know an intelligent creation? That's not the only evidence, Rich, that God's left behind for us. I'm leading you up to this, buddy. Uh, has shown us that he's real and we really can have an intimate personal relationship with the creator of the universe. I just started again, so guess what? There's got to be more. There's got to be more. You're more. <laughs> That's right. And you know me too well. That's right, folks. The second evidence, knowing us that God is real. We can really have a relationship. He's being gracious to us. And that is the evidence of a young creation. But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God's. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. If you find Matthew, what do you do? Right here. Mumble, you'll get it. That's right. Mark chapter 10. And this is really cool, folks. I mean, you think, well, does the Bible talk about evolution? Yes, it does, i.e. creation which counters it. And this is a neat passage. The passage actually is the Pharisees are trying to stump Jesus with a question. Now, if you want to talk about the ultimate uh, one-legged kicking contest, okay, uh, you got to come to Revelation tonight. But this is, I mean, can you imagine trying to stump God? Hello. That's called pride. And that was part of the Pharisees' problem. But they're trying to stump Jesus with one of those trick questions, okay? And, and it's a, a question about marriage, okay? But in that, folks, he gives us evidence for young creation, if you pay attention to what the scripture has to say. So let's take a look. Mark chapter 10. Let's read verses 1 through 9. Here's what it says. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, as was his custom, and he what? He taught him. Well, some Pharisees came and tested him by asking him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus replied, Well, why did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus tells them, here's the issue. Here's the bigger issue. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. And then Jesus tells them what was God's original plan. Jesus replied, but at the what? Beginning of creation. Let's read that again. At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man what? Separate. How many of you guys remember that passage of scripture? Men say yes because it was your wedding ceremony. You'll score some points, trust me. Okay? But folks, here's what's going on. The, the text is clear. The Bible's clear. When Jesus, he was just simply answering the question. Okay, I'll be, they were trying to trick him. Uh, concerning marriage, okay? He went, here's my point. He went right back to what? He went right back to the very first man, the very first woman, i.e. Adam and Eve, right? And folks, although we do not know the exact day that Adam and Eve were created, some theologians have determined, okay, that Adam must have been created sometime in the afternoon. Why? Because we know the scripture says he was created just before Eve. <laughs> that was for you, Bill. That's right. But that's right. Seriously, though, here's my point. Now you're waking up. That's good. Okay. Notice what else Jesus said in the text there. It wasn't just that great theological truth, okay? What did he say there about the very first marriage? Here's the point. He said it was the very, very first marriage because what? It was at the very, very first or beginning of creation. That's what made it the very first marriage. So here's the point, folks, from the lips of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. He just declared, think about it, that the literal account of creation in Genesis was the literal beginning of creation, right? 
And folks, here's the issue. If you start with Adam and Eve and you add up the Bible dates there, starting with Adam and Eve, you get an estimated creation date of roughly around 6,000 years old. And folks, this brings me to my first obvious problem that I have with evolution is, is you just called Jesus Christ a what? You just called him a liar. People stop and think about it. What does society, what does evolution teach? Does it teach what we just saw there in the text from Jesus, that a literal creation began with a literal Adam and Eve just a few thousand years ago? Are you kidding me? What do they say? They say we came from a cosmic burp to a crustacean to a caveman, right? And then not just over a few thousand years, but over millions and billions of years, right? And folks, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out you just called Jesus Christ a what? A liar. And how many guys would say that's probably not a very good thing to do? It's a new hobby, right? And folks, I'm telling you what you've got to understand, this whole timing issue, the millions and billions of years, it is the Achilles heel of the evolutionists, okay? It doesn't just call Jesus a liar. They've got to have tons of time for the theory, okay? Otherwise, it's going to fall flat on its face, okay? In fact, get this, time is, get this, the make-believe hero of their phony story. And they even admit it. Check this out. This is from a, a professor at Harvard University, George Wall. He admits it, folks. This is their hero to make this fairy tale come true. They need tons of time. He says, quote, time is, in fact, the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal with is in the order of two billion years. And he says, because of that, what we regard as the impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. In other words, what he's basically saying is, because we never see it demonstrated, we never see it repeated, we never, hey, if, if apes, if we came from apes, why don't we ever see it happening today? Think about it, folks. And that's what he's basically saying. And that's all meaningless. We don't never see it, but, but because all this time... Here's what he says. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible. The possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One only has to wait, and time itself performs the what? What'd he say? Oh, now I can preach on that one because they don't even believe in the supernatural, but what did he just say? But folks, here's my point. I'm glad he said miracle because that's exactly what it's going to take for evolution to ever come true. And basically, let me break it down even more. What did that guy just say? Let me translate. In a land far, far away. Something mystical, something magical is bound to take place, right? And folks, I don't know about you, but that's called a fairy tale. And folks, that's exactly what it is, but don't take my word for it. Let's get reacquainted with what constitutes a fairy tale, okay? Let's just do a little jog ourselves. First of all, you got a frog, okay? But not any frog. you got a cool 3D animated frog. That's right, Mark. I'll show you where you can get that animation for your sermon, too. That's right. <laughs> that's right. But you got a frog. But what? not just any frog. you got a frog in a land far, far away, further than Lockport. Okay? It's way out there, man. Okay, land far, far away, and, and all of a sudden has this chance encounter. For some reason, runs into this princess whose boyfriends are frogs or something, and stuff like that. And, and has this chance encounter, she just happens to kiss him, and voila, something mystical, something magical, a uh, prince is created, right? Ladies, how many of you got your husband by kissing a frog? All right, that's what I get for asking but anyway, you messed my sermon up. But anyways, <laughs> no, that's a fairy tale. That's not how you get your husband. You might look like a frog, smell like a frog, but we won't go there. Get the marriage series. It's out on the table. But anyway, that's right. Okay, that's not how. That's a fairy tale, right? Folks, stop and think about what we are being told today. Evolution is simply the new fairy tale. Except their frog is time itself. Millions and billions of years ago. In a land far, far away, okay? And then their encounter is with chance and self. And what is chance? It's nothing. It's an adjective to describe a mathematical probability. Because science land far, far away, something mystical, something magical happens. We never see it today, but hey, it's your fairy tale, and some sort of a creature evolves, right? <laughs> get it over with, Mark. I know you're going to want to wave at that guy. So just get out. Okay, well, here's my point, folks. Hell, well, that's a what? It's a fairy tale. It's an old-fashioned fairy tale in new clothing. But you might be out there thinking, okay, Pastor Billy, fine. That's your totally biased, unbiased opinion. Okay? But, but I got a problem with this, folks. I mean, you're going to force me almost into a position to sound like one of those wacky conspiracy people. I mean, come on, surely the evolutionists, if they're going to say we've been here for millions and billions of years, okay, they're not making this up as the stories that go along. It's got to be an exact science. I mean, it's all over the textbooks. It's all over the magazines. It's all over the television. It's in the school system. There's no way in the world they're making this thing up as they go along like a fairy tale. How many of you guys know I'm being sarcastic? Hey, you're catching on. That's right. I'll tell you what, folks, you be the just. Let's take a look at just the evolving dates of the evolution theory, folks. And you tell me, is this an exact science? I don't think so. They're making it up as they go. Are you kidding me? And let's take a look. And, and uh, pre-Darwinian influence, folks, for the majority of, of man's history, folks, we believe, just like the Bible said, a young creation. 1650, Bishop James Usher calculated creation day of Sunday, October 3rd, uh, 23rd, uh, 4000 B.C. Now, I know it's a guy thing, especially those of you hooked on mathematics. I don't think you can get quite that exact. Okay, but, <laughs> but it's roughly about 6,000 years ago. Okay, that was the basic premise. 
Now you start to get into a little bit of the, pre, the age of reason, man, humanism, elevated instead of God. And they start to crack a little bit, 75,000 years ago. But that's nothing. Now you get into pre-Darwinian influence with Lyle and Hutton, and you got 240 million years ago. Then you get into post-Darwinian influence, and you've got, it starts to crank up from here. 400 million years old. Oh, but no, it's a new century. So 1905, get this, it's 500 million to 1.64 billion years old. Oh, no, no, it's the Roaring Twenties. It's an exciting time. Do something new. That's right, two billion years old. No, 1947, it was rough during World War II. Uh, inflation's up. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, three billion years old, that's what it is. 1952, one to ten billion years old. How would you guys like to have that margin of error next time you fill out your taxes? <laughs> what? That's not exact. Give me a break. It gets worse than that, folks. 1987, 8 billion years old. But that's not all. How about 1995? 12 billion years old in just eight years. No wonder we're getting old. I mean, everything, I tell you what. But that's not. How about 1997? 13 billion years old. How about 1999? 13.4 billion years old. How about 2001? 14.8 billion years old. And the current date, folks, is 15 billion years old, although I didn't check the stats this week, so it might have changed. Folks, I don't know about you, but here's my point in bringing that whole issue up. That is not a very stable timeline. And it sounds like somebody's making this thing up as you go. And here's my point. At least Jesus Christ sticks to one story. But folks, I'm here to tell you, believe it or not, that's the tip of the iceberg. Let's move from this unstable timeline to some solid scientific facts. Jesus Christ, hello, is no liar. We've only been here for a few thousand years. He doesn't just say so. Science does. And the first evidence of a young creation, folks, is the evidence from space. This is the stuff they won't tell you, folks, but it is science. And it agrees with what Jesus says. Let's take a look at the facts. Use your own brains this morning. Let's start with star clusters. Folks, a star cluster contains hundreds or thousands of stars that are moving and held together by gravity. Now, here's the problem that evolutionists have, okay, folks? In some clusters, the stars are moving so fast, okay, that they could not have held together for millions and billions of years. They should have long since flown apart or unclustered by themselves by now. Therefore, since we still have clusters of stars, the age of the universe has to be measured in thousands of years, not billions of years. If everything came from a small little spinning dot and exploded onto the scene, folks, it's like a shotgun shell. The pattern starts off small, clumped together, but then what does it do? It spreads apart. We still have them in clumps, folks, showing us they haven't been around for that long. Let's take a look at the next one, folks. This is amazing. Supernovas. When big stars run out of fuel, they explode and become what we call supernovas. It's not that really cool car from Chevy. How many of you guys... Huh? Yeah, you thought you were super, but that was a nerd car. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> Anybody? I know I'm going to get asked the question, but that's right. Here's the supernova. Here's the point. Now, according to astronomical theory, in galaxies of our size, check this out. Approximately 7,250 supernova remnants should be visible if we've been here for millions and billions of years, okay? However, if you use our age, the creationist age of the galaxy, we should expect to find between 125 to 200 supernova remnants. Here's the facts, folks. The actual number of supernova remnants visible from the Earth is 205. That's a long shot from 7,200. But it sure is close to whose numbers? Hey, very interesting. It's almost like we haven't been around for that long. How about the existence of comets? This is amazing. The number of comets are decreasing due to decay. They're continually disintegrating, and a number of them have been known to already breaking up. Evidently, because of that, they believe, scientists know, they self-destruct within a relatively short period of time to the point it's believed that the lifespan of a comet lasts only how long? How long? 10,000 years. Here's the point. Use your brains, folks. Here's the problem. If comets have only lasting 10,000 years and the age of the universe is supposed to be billions of years, why do we still have comets? Right? Stop and think about it. The existence of comets shows us the age of the universe has to be measured in less than what? Bare minimum 10,000 years. Stop and think about it, folks. How about the amount of hydrogen? Hydrogen is constantly being converted into helium throughout the entire universe. Now, here's the problem that evolution has. If the universe were billions of years old, Folks, there would be no or almost no hydrogen left. It should have long since disappeared by now, uh, turned into helium. However, as noted professor of astronomy, Fred Hoyle uh, asserted, he said the universe consists almost entirely of what? Hydrogen. So stop and think about it, folks. This too shows us the universe has to be still quite young. Otherwise, it'd already be helium by now. Stop and think about it. How about the planet's rings? The rings of Saturn and Jupiter are primarily composed of ammonia and pebbles of various sizes. Now, the problem that evolutionists have with this, folks, they're trying to figure this out. They're trying to figure out why in the world are these rings still there? Because here's the facts. If the universe had been here for billions of years, folks, they should have long since vaporized into outer space long ago or been at best destroyed by meteoroids. But they're still there. And if that wasn't enough, folks, Jupiter's magnetic field should have swept, swept them out into the space by now. And furthermore, the rings of Saturn are distinctly bright when the debris left behind by comets should have caused them to turn dark by now. 
But the rings of Saturn aren't dark, they're bright, as you can see with your own eyes, folks, almost as if they're still kind of pristine and they haven't been around for that long. Very interesting, but that's the tip of the iceberg. This is amazing. Planets are cooling, folks, especially Jupiter and Saturn. They're huge. But the problem is they're cooling off rapidly. In fact, folks, it can be measured. They're losing heat twice as fast as they're gaining it from the sun. Okay? Now put two and two together. Here's the problem. If they were billions of years old, that evolution says, they should be what? Stone cold by now, okay? But they're not, folks. They're still piping hot as if they haven't been around very long. Let me give you the analogy. It's like a cup of coffee on uh, the, the table there. Hey, maybe you guys came over to my house. And uh, the, you come to my house, and I got a cup of coffee sitting there on the coffee table, because it's a coffee table, and that's what you do. And so, <laughs> you got a cup of coffee, and you walk in the door, and you see that thing, and all of a sudden I go up to you, and I say, hey, hey, what are you doing? Don't touch that thing. Do not touch that thing, Ed. You're going to burn your hands. That baby's piping hot. Back off. First of all, you'd say, stop drinking coffee. And two, <laughs> and two, you say, I'm going to call the deacons when I get out of here, buddy. <laughs> But you might say something like this, well, okay, Pastor Billy, why not? How long has it been there? And if I were to say this, it's been there for four billion years. <laughs> then you would say, I really am going to call the deacons. Until you would say, you're nuts. After four billion years, that cup of coffee would be what? Stone cold by now. It's the same thing, folks, with these plants. Why are they still piping hot? As if they haven't been around. For very long, but that's not all. How about the appearance of Venus? The high surface temperatures on Venus combined with other surface features support a young age, folks. They know this. Here's the problem. If the planet were 4 billion years old, as taught by evolution, its dense atmosphere would have long ago worn away all the craters, but they're still there. Stop and think about it. They're still there. In fact, folks, Richard A. Kerr, he wrote this in Science Magazine. This is the article. Check it out yourself. Venus, he says, is looking too pristine. Okay? He said, quote, the Venus flybys have shown that the planet to be what? Young in the extreme, his own words. He said when they read the geological clock, that tells them how old the Venusian surface is. He said they find a planet on the brink of what? Adolescence. They know it, folks. But that's not how about Mars. Just like Venus, neither can Mars be billions of years old. Because in only a few thousand years, folks, not millions, the type of harsh dust storms occurring on Mars would have eroded away the craters and the volcanoes. But once again, they're there too. Why are they still there? They should be long gone. But that's still all. Also, this long-term erosion would have obliterated the color differences on the surface of Mars. But as you can see with their own eyes, it's still full of what? It's color. It's almost as if that still hasn't been around for very long. A couple more here. The sun's solar wind. Uh, like a giant vacuum cleaner, the sun sweeps up almost 100,000 tons of inflow per day. Claudia, how would you like to have a shop back with that power? <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Huh? 100,000. Oh, that's a guy thing. So it sucks it in, but that's not all. What, at the same time, the sun's radiation pushes the particles outward. So it sucks it in, pushes it out. It's like a big old giant vacuum cleaner, okay? And scientists call the pointing Robertson effect. Now, here's the problem, folks. If the solar system is really billions of years old, like evolution teaches, then the solar system should have been swept clean by now. But guess what? It's not, folks. These microparticles are still in abundance. Therefore, our solar system has to be still quite young or be clean by now. How about the, uh, the size of the sun? This is funny. The sun has been discovered to be shrinking in size, kind of like me, and, uh, which means it used to be bigger, okay? How many of you guys can figure that out with no help? Shrinking in size, so it used to be bigger. Okay, now here's the problem, folks. If the solar system was 4.6 billion years old, okay, the sun, shrinking at a constant rate of about 0.1% per century, okay, folks, would have been so big, life on Earth would be impossible. First of all, the increased gravitational attraction, because it's so big, would have pulled Earth and the other planets into it. And how many guys would say, that would kind of ruin the real estate industry. <laughs> Stop and think about it, folks. There's no way, okay? And then, that, just as little as 50,000 years ago, folks, the sun would have been so big, our oceans would have boiled, and then far less time, only 25,000 years ago, it had been so big that all of life would have been barbecued. So at best, it's got to be less than 25. Or more, I would say, like Jesus said. How about the isotopes on the moon? A couple more. Isotopes known as U-236 and TH-30. How many of you guys want to name the next Christian band after that? U-236? I thought so. But anyway, if you get this, they're short-lived isotopes. Get this, okay? They were found in the lunar material. Why don't they talk about this, folks? Because it countered evolution. They're found in the, the moon rocks that they brought back. Now, the problem that it created was this. If the moon were of a vast age, these isotopes would have long since decayed and been absent from the samples. But guess what? They are in relative abundance, showing us that the age of the moon has to be measured in just a few thousand years, not billions. Because those isotopes are still there. And speaking of the moon, folks, one more. The moon's moving away from the earth at a rate of about two inches per year, okay? And that used to, it means it used to be what? Culture. You guys got two for two. That's good. Now, here's the problem. Stop and think about it. Do the math, folks. Just a few million of years ago, not billions, just a few million years ago, the moon would have been so close to the earth. By the way, the moon's gravitational pull uh, controls the tidal activity on earth, right? 
But just a few million, not billions, just a few million years ago, the moon would have been so close to the Earth that it would have created tides that destroy the Earth twice a day. And it's been clinically proven you can only comfortably drown once a day. <laughs> right? It's impossible. Life could not exist not even just a few million years ago. But still, keep doing the math, folks. The more time you add, the closer the moon gets, which would have been utterly catastrophic. Uh, for life on earth. In fact, some people think and jest that this may be what killed off the dinosaurs. Apparently, millions and billions of years ago, the moon was so close, folks, here's what happened to the dinosaurs. They got mooned. Smacked them right in the head. At least the tallest ones anyway, and they probably landed on the smaller ones and squished them. And, but hey, turn about fair play. If you're going to make a fairy tale, I'll make up one too. Folks, I don't know about you, but here's my point. I would say those scientific facts about space, they're not just interesting. They're pretty thinking hard on the old evolutionary theory, right? And folks, here's my point where you've got to understand this timing thing is the Achilles heel of evolution. They've got to have vast amounts of time in order for you and I to fall for their fairy tale. Without tons of time, folks, the whole thing falls flat on its face. And remember, folks, all it takes is just one. Think about it. Just one, not all of these. Just one of these to mess up the whole theory, right? Therefore, I don't know about you, but I'd say in light of the evidence, somebody might want to get a new theory. Maybe you should listen to Jesus. Hello, he's no liar. You know what I'm saying? Folks, that's an all. Get this. The second evidence showing us that Jesus Christ is not a liar. We do have a young creation is the evidence of earth. Oh, wait till you see that. And we're going to get to the issue. What about, anybody heard about carbon dating? Radiometric dating? Fossils? Stalactites? What about that stuff? Hey, Mary, thanks for asking. We'll get to that next time. Let's go ahead and pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Niagara Frontier Bible Church. And hope you enjoyed today's sermon. But in closing, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? Well, before you answer that, let me share one final thing with you. The Bible says that God is holy and that we are not. The Bible says that all of us, including myself, have fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of our sin is death. We don't deserve to go to heaven. We deserve to go to hell. And since we have a problem, we don't want to admit this, God out of love, sent us something called the Ten Commandments, His law, to show us that there's no way in the world that we could ever make it to heaven on our own. Let's take a look at a couple of them. The Bible says that you shall not lie, ever, not once in your life. How many guys have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Well, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just proved my point. That would make you and I a liar before God. The Bible says you shall not steal. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we've taken something, even once, in our lives without permission. That makes us a thief. The Bible says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And now the Lord's name has become a cuss word. We've broken that. The Bible says that makes us a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. If you think you're going to get to heaven on your own, you shall never do that. But hey, you might think, well, that's a piece of cake. I've never done that one. Really? Jesus said if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. One more. The Bible says you shall not murder. And you might say, hey, no problem that one. I've never done that. Really? Jesus said, if you hate somebody in your heart, it's the same as murder in his eyes. Folks, that's just five out of ten commandments. How are you doing? You're going to tell me that you're going to stand before God and you really think he's going to let you into heaven and he's going to ask you, hey, who are you? And you say, hey, God, let me in. By your own admission, I'm a lying, thief, blasphemer, adulterer, murderer, let me in. Folks, God's not going to let you in. We don't deserve to go to heaven, folks. We have broken God's law. We deserve to die and go straight to hell. Here's the good news. God doesn't want you to go to hell. So He's pardoned you for your crimes. He wants to get you off a of death row. And just like in real life, a person can get off a of death row if they receive the governor's pardon. But just like in real life, a governor could write the pardon, even though the person is guilty of their crime. He could write the pardon and say, you don't have to go to the death penalty. But if they don't receive that pardon from the governor, they will still go to the death penalty. Folks, that's what God has done every day to everyone all over the world. Jesus Christ took the death penalty in our place. And every day that a person is alive, God is reaching out to them, asking them, pleading with them, please receive my pardon for your crime. Please don't go through with the death penalty. Hey, if you're here today and you want to make sure that you're going to heaven, you need to receive God's pardon for your crime through Jesus Christ. If that's you today, 
then maybe you could pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I have broken your law. I am a sinner. I agree that you are holy and that I am not. And I'll never make it to heaven on my own. Please forgive me, Jesus, of all my sins. I believe that you died for me on the cross and rose again from the grave to pay the price for all my sins. I turn from my sins today and I turn to you. I trust in you, Jesus, and in you alone to take me to heaven. Make me into the person you want me to be. I surrender this life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, if you really prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, I want to be the first one to congratulate you. Welcome to God's Forever Family. But that's just the beginning. When a person first gets saved, which is just what happened to you, the Bible likens you as a baby. And a baby needs food, they need nutrients, they need somebody to care. And that's why something important you need to do now is to find a good, healthy church in your area who can help provide that nourishment for you. Unfortunately, not all churches are very good churches, so if you have some questions, then please contact us, and we'd be glad to help you out. You need to get a Bible. You need to read the Word of God. And that's where you're going to find out about God and His wonderful plan and the reason and what He has planned and, and saved you for. You need to find it out in there as well. You need to pray to God. He's with you now wherever you go as His child. And prayer is not something mystical or magical. It's just simply having a conversation with God wherever you go. And finally, you need to tell somebody else about your new relationship with God and how that they can know for sure today how they can go to heaven instead of hell through God's pardon through Jesus Christ. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Niagara Frontier Bible Church. If there's anything we can do to help you, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our information, our contact information will be coming up on the screen here shortly, and we'd love to hear from you. Remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Niagara Frontier Bible Church. If you'd like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 5287 Bronson Drive, Lewiston, New York, 14092, or you can give us a call at 716-297-8783, or for email, office at niagarafrontierbible.com, or you can visit our website at www.niagarafrontierbible.com.